Welcome to part one in an ongoing series of utterly grim stories of shipwrecks with a shipwreck enthusiast, shall we say, each weekend, John McChrystal. John, what was your fascination with shipwreck stories? I think pretty much ever since I've been a small boy, I've been interested in these horrific tales of the sea. I guess I got into it because I was interested in sunken treasure, like all small boys. And uh, it led quite naturally into the stories of how treasure comes to be sunken, and uh, that was shipwrecks. And of course, in terms of stories, shipwrecks are just pure gold in, the, in, in their own right. So that, that was the initial interest. Really, uh, the, for those that have survived, that, that can tell the tale, it's hard to imagine uh, more, more suffering. Um, it's hard to imagine grimmer situations that people could ever find themselves in. Absolutely. It, it's interesting, shipwrecks themselves, that they're a little bit like a prism, I suppose, and human nature's sort of muddling along uh, on a ship on its way somewhere, and then it strikes this event, this prism, and what you find is that human nature gets refracted into a kind of spectrum of behaviours, and you get the really good and the really not so good. And then, of course, if everyone struggles ashore, they're then left with the, uh, the problem of how to survive, and what you get then are inspiring tales of human ingenuity and also some pretty ghastly stories of how humans fail to be ingenious. Under that sort of pressure, it's amazing the differences in reactions to it and how it reveals people's characters rather than makes them, perhaps. Yeah, I think people find resources within themselves that they never knew they had, and others who probably thought of themselves as noble, upright, resourceful characters before they were thrust in the situation are pretty bitterly disappointed with how they... Um, how they're found out. Well, listeners, uh, in listening to these, I hope you better appreciate whatever warmth you have because it can make you shiver just listening to what these people have had to put up with. And of course, I suppose, John, we should remember that heroic tales, grim tales, many of them we just don't know about because nobody survived. Absolutely. Uh, you, you can rest assured that the story of pretty much every shipwreck that's ever happened, the same kinds of things will have surrounded them. But of course, with no one left to bring the, the stories back, uh, we just don't know them. Some, some of the places we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about the Auckland Islands shortly, there have been a heap of shipwrecks there, and there may have been shipwrecks that no one even knows about because the great stories, the stories of the greatness of the people who were involved just haven't reached us. Yeah, it has to have someone survive to get through and tell the story. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's talk about the Auckland Islands. Well, let's talk about New Zealand to begin with before we focus on the Auckland Islands to kick off with. There are shipwrecks all around the world, but we have some pretty spectacular ones in our own local history. We sure do. I guess that's partly because we're a maritime nation. Uh, the very first people to settle New Zealand, the Maori, came here by sea and everyone subsequently came by sea until the advent of long distance aircraft of course and you can't devise a means of transport without also having to put up with the um the systems failures where transport comes unstuck and in the days of ships that was shipwrecks the maori even have stories about shipwreck some of their stories around our coasts commemorate uh, great shipwrecks down at moiraki for example there are stories of one of the canoes meeting a pretty spectacular fate just off offshore there. So as long as ships have been visiting New Zealand shores, there have been shipwrecks. It's the nature of the beast. Some of them are as good as stories you'll find from anywhere else in the world, really. I suspect shipwrecks are happening. Castaways continue to happen today, even with the advent of GPS, better communications and more seaworthy vessels. The sea will often win, and because of the vastness, especially of uh, the great oceans, that castaways and shipwrecks will still happen. Yep, yeah, it's bound to be happening, even as we speak in many ways. Uh, I guess where people are, are driven to sea of necessity in the way that boat people are and you often hear stories of Pacific Islands fishermen who are, who are driven out to sea and extraordinary tales of survival there at times. Yachtsmen, but then all it takes is to get a, a great big ultra modern ocean liner with a slightly faulty captain aboard such as happened in the Mediterranean recently mm. and you've got a recipe for disaster there straight away as well.
Uh, uh, let's kick off with the Auckland Islands. Now, this is how many miles or kilometres south of Stewart Island? To give people a bit of an atlas in their head. Yeah, if you go straight south, basically, from Stewart Island for 285 nautical miles, or 400 kilometres for landlubbers, you'll strike the Auckland Islands. Now, the significance of them in the history of seafaring is that in the days when people were sailing to Australia, they would sail what was known as the Great Circle Route. The idea being that because the bottom of the world is pretty much uncluttered with land, you get this belt of westerly winds that just roar ceaselessly around the circumference of the globe. And in the days of wind-borne vessels, that of course was like a super highway. So you duck down as into the higher latitudes and pick up the westerlies and sail round to the point where you wanted to go and then duck up again to your destination. Sounds really simple. <laughs> of course, that's the Southern Ocean and those latitudes aren't known as the Furious 50s for nothing. The westerlies are incredible, as are the seas that they kick up in the Southern Ocean, which also happens to be bloody cold. So not for the faint-hearted really, but that was the standard route for vessels sailing out from England to Australia or a little bit later on New Zealand. Trouble is, if you're sailing from Tasmania to Cape Horn, if you look south of New Zealand, you can see the subantarctic islands there. One group is called the snares and one group is called the traps. And after that, they actually get just slightly nastier and worse. And the Auckland Islands were the worst of the lot. Is that why they're called the snares and the traps? Because they snare and trap ships that um, in the middle of the night don't know they're there. That's right. Cook named the traps because, yeah, someone sailing around that piece of land would seriously risk running into them. And then 50-odd years later, when the snares were discovered, George Vancouver, who, who was their discoverer, recognised again that anyone sailing to New Zealand or sailing from Australia had better look out for these things because they were laid almost as though someone was trying to trap shipping with them. Funnily enough, though, it was the Aucklands that were the, the real ship killer. There are a number of reasons for that. First thing is, they were first discovered in 1806 and they were quite accurately charted by a man named Abraham Bristow. But then after that, the only people who had any business calling there really were sealers and whalers, mostly sealers. And of course, when you've discovered a bit of a gold mine, sort of crawling and bouncing with seals flopping around on every available space, you're not going to declare to the world exactly where you found it. Uh -huh. So it seems as though one of the influential charts used in the early days of shipping in this area charted them 25 to 30 miles out of position. Another one, of course, is that the Southern Ocean being very cold, it's frequently closed in and clagged up and overcast and misty. So in the days when you needed to see the sun in order to work out where you were, you were quite often sailing blind, and that could go on for days. It's fine if it's a day or two, but say four or five days, and all you've got to go on is your last position and a bit of educated guesswork that area of uncertainty becomes pretty wide. So you've got these islands right on your route, and the weather's been closed in for four or five days, you don't know where you are, and the chart is showing you they're actually 35 miles out of position. Uh, <laughs> It's not hard to see why there's 11 shipwrecks on the coast of the Auckland Islands. This isn't like being stranded on a tropical island. The, the, the weather there is just atrocious. You can get the odd nice day, but mostly it just gets strafed with hail and sleet and snow and rain in a fairly high rotation. It's absolutely pounded by these westerly winds that we mentioned before, because it's about the only thing in their way. Those westerlies kick up the most enormous seas which just smash into the west coast which is completely perpendicular. I've had the privilege of being there and it really is the most extraordinary landscape. If you stand on say Queen Street or Aotea Quay and look at the skyline of the city and imagine that that skyline was just rock, black rock, you'd have just a bit of a feel for what the west coast of the Aucklands is like. The cliffs are up to sort of seven, eight hundred feet high, even higher in places, and it's just one continuous rampart. And so you're sailing along, not really knowing where you are, four or five days after your last sighting, you know you're roughly in the vicinity of land, but you think you're well clear to the south or the north, and then suddenly out of the mist, this is what you see. And the, the shock of that alone would be enough to, to carry away a few faint-hearted souls, I would think. And 
a strong westerly battering you into it means uh, th there's no reverse for the That's ship. That's right. Th these ships did not have a reverse. They didn't have engines and they didn't sail to weather. That means they couldn't go into the wind very well. So generally speaking, what happened is once they were in that situation, nothing could save them. The wind and the sea was all conspiring to push them into the cliffs. One of the most astounding stories, there are many, but I don't think I'm out of line in saying that this is peculiar, uh, is the story of the Grafton and the Invercold, because these two wrecks, both on Auckland Island at the same time, and yet they never met up. They never knew the other was there. It was quite extraordinary. Utterly yeah. extraordinary, I think, in world terms as well, which is what makes this one of the great stories. Yeah. Uh, listeners interested in finding out more about it could read Joan Druitt's book. It's called Island of the Lost, and it tells these two stories together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a terrific book. It does make you feel rather comfy when you're lying in bed reading those sort of stories. Doesn't it? You lie in a warm bath. Yeah. And, yeah, <laughs> you, you and boy, it. you appreciate it. Episode one looking at the Auckland Islands and the wreck of the Grafton. John McChrystal will be with us again very shortly. It's the Weekend Variety Wireless with Graham Hill. Welcome back to Shipwreck Stories and our Shipwreck Storyteller, John McChrystal. Today we're having a look at the incredible story of the Grafton. Yeah, the Grafton was a small vessel really. She was a, a schooner, so she had two masts. Uh, she's about 90 tonnes, so it was probably about 80 or 90 feet long. She was made of the wreck of a Spanish man of war, interestingly, which is why quite a lot of the shipwreck still remains at Auckland Island. But she was sailing out of Sydney in 1864 under the command of a man named Thomas Musgrave and with only four crew aboard. Their plan was to go prospecting on Campbell Island, where it had long been suspected there was tin and copper, and where there's copper there's quite commonly gold. So. They were out to make their fortune, they thought, by discovering the mother load somewhere in the deep south. They failed. <laughs> they got to Campbell Island and they found nothing of any value whatsoever. And they also discovered that their plan B, which was to, to, to knock a few seals on the head and take the skins back to defray expenses, was no good either because everyone had been there before them and the seals were all gone too. So plan C was to head across to the Auckland Islands and do a spot of sealing there just to try to get something in return for their investment. So off they went. They sailed across. It was a pretty rough crossing. By the time they reached Cardley Harbour, which is in the south of Auckland Island Group, they were pretty glad to see land and they dropped anchor in what looked to them to be the perfect anchorage. High cliffs around them, calm waters, completely shut off, so they thought, from the wind. And then to their utter horror, the wind switched to the northwest, and it was roughly hurricane force as they estimated, and uh, they dragged their anchor and the ship was driven ashore and wrecked. She wasn't wasn't a total wreck, she wasn't smashed to bits, but she, um, she couldn't be salvaged. The holes knocked on the side were too great and down she went. They blundered ashore, uh, all five of them. They managed to salvage a few bits and pieces. Uh, significantly, they had a box of matches, though they didn't know it when they got ashore. They had some flour, some biscuits, some salt meat, some tobacco, some sugar, and a couple of cooking utensils. And uh, subsequently, they were able to go back and pull a few other bits and pieces off the, the wreck as well. Could they stay uh, in the boat, or were they out in the open? They were out in the open initially. When they first got ashore, they did so by stringing a line with their 12-foot their dinghy ashore and one brave man swimming the line onto the beach in this pounding surf. Uh, once they got ashore, they put a sailcloth up and they sort of huddled, huddled under that in the, in the far from clement weather until the morning. And then after that, they began to take stock. What did they set about doing? to try and survive. Would they have been hopeful that anyone would come around the corner soon? Yeah, now that's a really good question because of course, so far as anyone knew, they were on Campbell Island. So yes, that they, they knew that someone might mount a search in a month's time, but they knew that that person would be looking in the wrong place. There are two journals that have survived from this shipwreck, one by a man named Francois Reynal, uh, a Frenchman, um, I won't continue to attempt to pronounce his name because my French is awful, so I'll call him Raynal. And uh, there was Thomas Musgrave. Raynal was sort of the Paul McCartney to Musgrave's John Lennon. Uh, Raynal was an optimist, and Musgrave appears to have been 
a real misery guts, actually. He could be forgiven for that, given the circumstances, but whereas the others sort of bore up and got on with it, and Raynal in particular managed to be optimistic at pretty much all times, poor old Musgrave had real bouts of depression, which he recorded the uh, amusement of posterity in his journal. The first thing they had to confront when they got ashore was the, the pretty natural tendency to despair completely that they would be rescued. Mm. Raynal had his moment, he wandered off from the rest and he reckons despair completely overcame him, but then he, uh, he just managed to shake that off and then he never seems to have suffered another moment's doubt. He was just pretty clear that if they weren't rescued they would rescue themselves from that moment forward. Musgrave was initially, yeah, just a bit stunned and shocked, I think, and then he just completely lost it, but Raynal managed to talk him round. Pretty much that's the way this group of five men got on for the next 18 months that they were ashore. What they did is they just fed off one another's resources, and by resources it wasn't just physical, it was also their, their own mental strength, their ability to jolly one another out of this awful situation. The level of organisation that Musgrave put in place has me scratching my head. Having read Joan Druitt's book, I was just amazed to hear that there was a plan, we will make a proper hut, and they spent ages making a proper hut before going in it, and in the meantime just surviving under little bits of branches and stuff. Yeah, that's right. They, they had their, their little bivouac, but they decided that if they were going to survive, they needed a decent hut. They were there in the summer, and it was awful. So what they, what they needed was something that would help <laughs> right, them to survive at, the winter. Right, yeah. if this is summer, we better yeah, get ready. That's right, that's right. And so they were very fortunate in that they had in their midst a, a do-it-yourself god in the form of Reynal. He saved their bacon with his ingenuity, there's just no doubt about it. And the list of his accomplishments is just unbelievable. When you look at the Namby Pamby people, they throw onto islands and film them, called Survivor, and you compare and contrast this humble little Frenchman. Uh, it's, yeah, there's, they're different species. Mm. As you say, organisation was a big part of it. They divided their labour, and so while Raynal was busy devising a way of making cement out of seashells, the rest of them were busy exploring and hunting as best they could to try to build up a bit of a a stock of food that they could use while they were completely engaged in the business of building the hut. Why was Raynal making cement? Well, they knew they needed a fire, and the best way to, the safest way to have a fire in a hut was going to be to have a decent chimney. So away they went, they, um, they made cement, they built this great big huge pyramidal chimney using bits and pieces from the ship, but mostly homemade cement and the rocks with which Auckland Island abounds. So they built this huge chimney and then they built a hut about 24 feet by 16 feet and that was their their home for the next 18 months. How long did it take for them to make this thing while they were out there in the misery cold and getting wet? And being bitten by sand flies and oh. absolutely tormented by blue bottles which apparently snuck up on you and laid great big clutches of maggots in whatever crevice they could find, which is not a happy thought. No, no. No, they were in those conditions for around a month and of course every now and then a great big storm had come through and they couldn't do anything but huddle there and try to survive. Uh, where, where were they huddled while they were starting? up this building site. They were huddled just on the, the head of the beach really with the Grafton lying there taunting them with her smashed up remains just off the beach yeah. and their, their building site was about 40 metres, it's a surprisingly short distance from the water actually, you just walk up the hill and it's not a, not a steep hill and there's a small clearing where these days there's just a pile of rocks marking where the chimney was. But in the meantime, yes, they were just bivouacked in the bush. And that B would be for most what is, of us. What does that yeah. mean, bivouacked in the bush? What was over their heads and bit under them? Bit of sailcloth. Weren't really ferns or anything they could they could use t to any great effect as, as flooring. So basically it was just the soft, damp, peaty soil of Auckland Island. They were all immensely dissatisfied with their tent, which leaked, as you would expect. And uh, they couldn't wait to get this, this hut finished. Mm. The hut, once they'd initially finished it, of course, was a big disappointment too. They all commented, they both commented in their um, their journals that it let in the wind very effectively. It was just made of canvas over a, over a timber and what they call lathe frame, just thin bits of, of wood. Uh, so they, they thatched it eventually with tussock grass, which was an epic 
endeavour in its own right. And eventually, it got so comfortable that they had bookshelves for their four books, they had spaces for their own belongings, they had a table, they had a desk, and they even had a couple of little windows made of glass that they salvaged from the wreck. That's incredible resourcefulness. They would have been, they not got a great diet here, I don't think. What were they eating? What was their physical condition through which they struggled and built this hut? Yeah, they were pretty much exclusively uh, eating seal meat, and by that I mean sea lion meat. But they all had a very violent intestinal reaction to a, to a diet that consisted of sort of fat, fried in fat, over an open fire. They were fortunate in that they discovered a, a plant that grows on uh, most of the sub-Antarctic islands called Stilbocarpa, which the sealers and the whalers knew as Macquarie Island cabbage, because sealers and whalers quite commonly found themselves having to subsist on whatever they could find. Mm -hmm. And this one was quite a handy, starchy sort of route. That kept scurvy at bay. Rainall actually managed to distill brandy from it, but having discovered he was capable of it, then threw it away and told the others he'd failed because he was afraid of what would happen if he introduced demon drink. Hero Rainall, again. Situation. Again, again. But again, all the while, all the while that this is happening, they've got their hut, they've got themselves installed in it. There's just this nagging despair and there's the interpersonal relations to be managed. You've got five people who knew each other pretty well, but there was this awkwardness because Musgrave was their captain, but the men, now that Musgrave was the captain of nothing because he'd lost his ship, were getting a bit antsy. They didn't like being told what to do because they felt they were doing most of the work and he was lying around basically scratching in his journal about how miserable he was. So Raynal managed that one as well. He persuaded them all that it would be great if they held elections and elected themselves a leader. And the others all agreed to this, although the, the ordinary seamen put in a writing clause saying that if he was no good at it, they could vote him out again. And then they had this election. Raynal nominated Musgrave and he was unanimously elected. So that small problem was brilliantly managed. It really was. And after that, they had no further problems with leadership or insubordination. It would have been a hard time on the anniversary of their wrecking, and they kept a calendar, they knew when that was. A year had gone. Yeah, um, it was particularly hard because the anniversary came in the summer, which was when they most expected or hoped to be rescued. And of course, when that anniversary came and went, and there was no sign of anyone coming to rescue them, despair was, was biting pretty hard at that point. And of course, that's when they, they started first contemplating the idea that they might have to rescue themselves. Poor old Musgrave did it particularly hard. Unlike the others, he was married and had children. Reading his journal, it's, it's heart-wrenching the way he, he frequently finishes a passage that began somewhere completely differently, just with a, with a lamentation about how hard his family must have it. Stay tuned to hear how this outrageous story of suffering and survival turns out. Live. It's Graham Hill's Weekend Variety Wireless. In 1863, a crew of five from the Grafton are marooned on the Subantarctic Auckland Islands and are about to endure their second winter there. The winters, how bad were they? Winter is pretty bleak there. Uh, it's actually not that different to summer. <laughs> it snows and it sleets and it hails and it blows. So it's pretty much like the summer. The average temperature goes right down and it hovers just above zero for large periods of time. And probably the worst thing about the winter is in the latter half of the winter, the sea lions, their staple food, need to gain condition for the breeding season, so they disappear off to sea. So these poor guys struggling out, facing weather that, that made it dangerous to venture out in the first place, discovered that they could walk for up to 10 miles and not see a single seal. Pretty desperate times. And they would have been starving. They were starving. They came pretty close. There were times when I think it just came down to the fact that one or two of them had more energy than the rest that uh, enabled them to, to happen upon a stroke of luck, one lazy seal that happened to be hanging around when it should be at sea, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, and, they managed to keep a between them. and they managed to keep a fire going the entire time? 
Yeah, uh, from a box of matches that one of them happened to, to discover in his pocket. And when you read these castaway stories, that, that's the constant refrain. That they're all looking around saying, we need fire. And they're all going, well, there's no flint here. There's no iron. How are we going to make a fire? And then someone will say, hang on a minute, and pull out a box of matches. And of course, the matches are always wet. That's, that's very important for your castaway story. They're always wet. Uh, they, they, they tried striking five before one finally caught and burned. And after that, of course, they were never going to let that fire go out. Mm. It would have been a source of anxiety as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't let us go out. Just in case you needed another source of anxiety. Yeah, yes, there you go. Yes, exactly. Yep. A second winter. Oh, my goodness. Just to think, okay, after a second winter, they had decided, look, no one's going to come and get us. But, but how does one contemplate getting out of there? You haven't got a ship. What are they going to do? Yeah. Swim? Yeah, there you go. They, um, they looked at each other and they knew that no one was coming to rescue them that summer. So that meant another winter in prospect and none of them could face that. So they all decided they had to save themselves. Um, Reynolds' suggestion was to pull the Grafton apart and build up another smaller vessel and they'd all save themselves in that. So, of course, the man who'd made homemade soap, he'd discovered a way of tanning the, um, the seal skin so that they could make shoes. Uh, he'd also made clothing out of it. We've already seen him making cement, of course. Uh, he thought, well, I'll build a forge. And so that's what he did. Of course, everyone knows how to build a forge. Um, <laughs> all you need is a, a furnace and bellows, and then you need to make charcoal, and everyone knows how to make that. He did it. He, he built a forge. He managed to make charcoal out of the rata. He built his forge, and then he set about building himself some carpentry tools with his forge. They had lots of iron. He built a forge to make things. tools to make a boat. That's right, yes. Well and you're that freezing, yeah. and you're hungry, and you're miserable. That's right. And you're faced with the prospect of a winter where food is going to be even scarcer as well. So even all this effort was a luxury. Expending the effort to rescue yourself was a luxury. Mm. But yeah, he, he said about it, he built a saw, he built hammers of various sorts. They had to build every nail and every bolt they proposed to use. And in fact, their plan to build a schooner came unstuck when Raynal found he was just completely unable to make a hand drill, an auger. He just couldn't temper a tip that would stay there when you were trying to drill through this hard timber. So that, that plan was an abject failure. So he had to announce this to the group, the fact that plan A was not going to work, so he needed a plan B, and his plan B was that they would modify the ship's boat, which they still had after all this time. Everyone was a bit aghast at that, because they looked at their poor old leaky, wobbly 12-foot dinghy and thought 285 miles across the most turbulent oceans on, on Earth, and that, no thank you. But of course they had no option. Uh. So that became plan B, and that's what they did. In order to make it seaworthy, they lengthened her. So from a 12-foot boat, they lengthened the keel out to about 17 feet and then raised the gunnels, raised the sides of the boat by a couple of feet as well, and then decked her over. It's remarkably similar, in fact, to what McNeish and Shackleton did with the James Caird, which they rescued themselves with. Uh -huh. uh, that might be a story for another day. Yeah. But yeah, these epic boat journeys... This one is right up there with them. They um, modified the vessel so that she was roughly seaworthy. They filled her with ballast, which was mostly rocks and iron, and then they all piled merrily aboard to sail her back to the place where they proposed stocking up and leaving from and discovered that she just wouldn't sail with five people aboard. She would barely float. So <laughs> then they had to decide who got left behind. Musgrave decided he could take two people with him, and in fact it would be unsafe to take any fewer, so that meant two had to stay behind. So he chose the only one who said that there was no way he was setting foot in that boat to make that journey. He chose him to stay behind, and then the bloke who got on best with him. So those two poor guys were left in the hut while the others, 27th of June 1865, pushed the boat out. Um, hoisted the sail and disappeared into the mist. Was Raynal on the boat? how they must have felt. Was... Raynal was on the boat. Uh, Musgrave, of course, was on the boat. And a Norwegian seaman by the name of Alec, or they called him Alec, his real name was Alexander MacDonald. Those three went, uh, leaving the, the poor old Portuguese cook, the noseless Portuguese cook, and a man named George ashore 
Mm. And I, I just wonder what thoughts must have gone through the heads of those guys as they saw the others disappearing into the mist. Uh, it's one thing to be sailing, maybe to your death, maybe to rescue, but at least doing something. It's quite another to resigning yourself to even bleaker prospects of survival if the others fail. And they headed for Stewart Island? Yep, they headed for Stewart Island. They were lucky they had navigational instruments. They also knew where New Zealand was, so that placed them at a considerable advantage to another crew we'll talk about in one of these boat journeys later. They set off, they were immediately engulfed in a storm, as happens, and uh, they got turned turtle at least once. Uh, they were all pretty sure they were going to die, but the boat ended up, after the wave had broken over them, sitting upright and just bailing furiously. It took them to the 24th, so five days and five nights, during all of which Musgrave was at his post, and then they sailed into Port Adventure on Stewart Island, 11 o'clock on a very fine morning, uh, much to the amazement of all ashore. And um, what a sight they must have been. They were a pretty ragged bunch in their sealskin clothes. Yeah, beard, haven't slept for five days, haven't eaten properly for the best part of 18 months. Yes, they would have looked quite a sight. And then to go back. I mean, it's it's a perilous journey for anyone. They yeah. had to go back and rescue their mates. That's right. They happened upon a, a fellow by the name of Tom Cross, who owned an oyster boat called the Flying Scud at Port Adventure. He took them over to Invercargill and announced what was happening down on the Aucklands and was immediately voted the man most eligible to go down and rescue the other two. So they had a crack, but they kept getting turned back by the weather, by a faulty compass, by all sorts of things. And it was a month before they got to the Auckland Islands. And that's plenty long enough for those two sitting, sitting there on the Aucklands to think to themselves, well, we haven't seen them for a month. I think we can pretty much give up all hope of seeing them alive again. And now 19 months, I understand that their condition was perilous as well. Yeah. Their physical condition was really falling. Yeah, as, as when you think about it, it had to be. With the boat, they'd barely managed to keep the five of them alive. With the boat gone, the opportunity to travel anywhere, any great distance from the, the hut was just about, well, it was completely taken away. They managed to build a raft and they did get about a bit, but yeah, the effort of keeping two alive was far greater than the effort of keeping five alive. So they were just about gone, poor buggers. It's hard to imagine what it must have felt like for those people to see each other again. That's right. Musgrave and Raynal and the other one and to go back and actually find these guys, what were they like? What was, just describe that. Yeah, it was a misty morning. It was August the 24th and uh, the flying scud came out of the mist and anchored just offshore from the beach. They couldn't see any sign of the others. They went ashore and they walked up towards the hut and uh, they saw the youngest of the party. Uh, I believe it was George standing outside and he, he apparently just went white as though he'd seen a ghost and he couldn't speak, he, he practically collapsed. They found the poor old, I keep calling him the noseless Portuguese cook inside and apparently all he could do was pump Musgrave's arm up and down and say, Captain Musgrave, how are you? How are you? How are you? As you would. Yeah, th I think the two were just about demented with disbelief and... Uh, and relief and whatever else you'd feel at that moment. And something I think so honourable is that Musgrave went around looking for other castaways, but having experienced 18 months there, he thought, maybe there's somebody else. Let's go look. Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. You, you would think that they just couldn't wait to shake whatever passed for dust of the Aucklands off their feet. You'd just want to get the hell out of there and as safe as you could, as quickly as you could. But on their way in, they spotted smoke, they thought, uh, from the cliffs about eight miles north of where Epigwaite, which is the name of their hut, was. And Musgrave was haunted by that. And rather than just think of his own safety, he thought, if there's any other poor bugger on this island, I'm going to take him off. And they did quite an extensive search of the east coast, looking for any traces. But they didn't find anybody, did they? Well, they found one corpse. Up at Port Ross, they, um, which is at the other end of the island, they found a corpse lying in the remains of a hut of a man who'd clearly died from starvation. And this was, in fact, the mate, the second mate from the Invercald. Mm. And that was the first inkling they had, that they were not alone the yeah. whole time they were there. 
We'll have to leave that story for another day. But the legacy of Musgrove went on to set up those little stations with supplies in them as well uh, for, for castaways. That's right. Agitation was pretty intense in both New Zealand and Australia that depots should be set up for anyone else who should find themselves in this situation once the news of the Invercald and the Grafton reached civilization again. Mm. Um, can you recall the notice, the writing, the, the sign that is on the front of them? I found it quite compelling. Yeah, I love this one. It's, um, it was in fact the person who went searching for castaways from the General Grant, the possibility that the, uh, the General Grant survivors who set off in their own small boat to try to be rescued, just in case they were back on Auckland Island, there was an expedition sent to find them and then also to stock a castaway depot. So yes, he, he built this depot and he put a notice on it which read something like, The curse of the widow and the fatherless light on he who openeth these doors when he hath a ship at his back. Yeah, it is compelling because the thought of having a ship at your back is just what those castaways dreamt of every yeah. day. Absolutely. And in the case of the Grafton, 18, 19 miserable months. What an achievement. What a story of, of survival. John McChrystal, thank you very much. Incredibly, after 19 months as castaways on the Auckland Islands, this group of five rescued themselves with no loss of life. The wreck of the Grafton and part of the hut's chimney can still be seen today on the shores of Carnley Harbour. And you can see the images on the Weekend Variety Wireless webpage.